Dr. Michael Reale, who is an assistant professor of computer science. He received his PhD from Binghamton University in 2014. It's still wet. <laughs> he was awarded the Barry M. Goldwater Scholarship in 2006 and the Chancellor's Award for Student Excellence in 2007. In 2013, he was a recipient of Binghamton University's Graduate Student Award for Excellence in Research. You're a hot dog, huh? And selected for the IEEE FG13 Conference Doctoral Consortium. Very good. He has over 13 publications, including top journals and conferences. So his current research is in an array of topics, and I'm going to tell you what they are. Automatic, multimodal, facial activity analysis, affective state recognition, eye gaze estimation, gesture recognition and animation, bimodal data creation, social signal processing, game design and development, computer vision, computer graphics, human machine interaction, and GPGPU. Is that right? That's not my fault. General purpose programming for graphics processing. For computer vision. I always have to do a double thing myself. And somewhere in this so I give you Michael Rio.
you could use expression in some way, shape, or form. So there's potential there. There's also a lot of work done in automatic pain detection. So one version of this would be you have a patient who's in a hospital bed, they can't move suddenly, they're in extreme pain, maybe they can't hit the button or whatever. Maybe you have a system that says, oh wait, let me alert appropriate medical staff and have them rush in and help this guy because he's in extreme pain. Or you might have someone who's coming in and saying, hey, I really, really need some pain medication, and they might be faking it. So something that's able to accurately assess whether a person is in pain is useful in that respect. Related to that is applications for security and military, so lie detection. Many of you have seen the show Lie to Me, but it's kind of the same thing, just having a machine do it, where they're detecting whether a person's genuine or not. There's applications in airport security, so if someone's walking through the airport, they look like they're potentially violent or whatnot, perhaps you can track them a little bit more closely. <clears throat> There's also applications with different vehicle or aircraft kind of heads-up displays. You know, how a person, if a person started to stress out when they're in combat, for example, you might have something that is able to respond accordingly if they're down. There's applications in the commercial area. So we have advertisements. Is anyone actually looking at our advertisement? And when they do look at it, are they going, oh gosh, not this ad again? So it's useful there. There's sort of an overarching thing when these sort of blur together with customer service training and automatic tutoring. We're basically, it's simulating person-to-person -person interaction. So human beings are really good at, well, comparatively good at recognizing expression, seeing where people are looking. We just sort of do this without thinking about it. If we can simulate that, then we can have sort of artificial teachers that are able to respond to how the student is reacting to the material. If they look confused, maybe the machine will automatically say, okay, hold on, let me explain this in a little bit more detail or perhaps switch to another subject matter. And then, sort of the, let's say the, I don't want to say the fun version, but the other application that's pretty obvious with this one is entertainment. So, if you are in a virtual world or a game or whatnot, and you have NPCs that are able, not player characters, that are able to look at you and respond to how you look, where you're looking, and how you feel, that makes the whole experience a lot more immersive. The long and the short of it is, <clears throat> One major aspect of this is that anything where you're trying to simulate person-to-person -person interaction, you kind of need something that's able to tell where you're looking and how you feel. Okay? So that's sort of the overarching ideas. But like any good research problem, there's challenges. So the first problem is input data. So what are we going to use to figure out a person's expression and where they're looking? The most common use, use data right now is 2D. Like the stuff you get from a webcam or even a high-resolution camera. It's everywhere, it's easy to get cameras for this. The data size is smallest compared to the other modalities you could use, but there's issues with it. The biggest problems have to do with head pose, occlusion, lighting changes. Pretty much the problem is we don't have depth information. So if I turn my head like this, as far as 2D is concerned, that could be an entirely different face. It's kind of hard to figure out, to pull out the depth information to figure out, no, it's the same person, they just look to the left. Okay. Lighting changes. It's difficult to ascertain whether the 3D object you're looking at is the same thing. It just may be that the lighting changed, but 2D is really hard to determine that. And then there's also issues related to that of occlusion. If something gets in the way, like glasses, or the person grows a mustache, or something along those lines, it's hard to tell that it's the same person in 2D, where in 3D you might be able to ascertain, okay, there's a 3D object, this mustache, or whatever it is that's in front of the person, but it's the same guy as the foot. Okay? So, now you're starting to see more work done with 3D data. So you have a depth camera that captures information from the subject. And the nice thing about this is, well, okay, now we can deal with issues of head pose. So as long as we've got the 3D model captured correctly, it doesn't really matter where their head is. We can just sort of realign it back to the frontal view and deal with what we want to deal with. Also, if you've captured the model correctly, then lighting isn't an issue anymore. Kind of a caveat because some depth cameras have trouble if the lighting is not set up properly, but it depends on how the system is set up. But either way, once you've got it, lighting's not an issue. But the problem is now you've got larger data. I mean, 3D, just almost by definition, has to be larger than 2D. And also, similar to 2D, you still have problems of noise. So you may have this point cloud that represents the person's head, but the actual surface of it, there may be little bumps in it, there may be points that are willy-nilly left and right. Also, for the most part, there's a trade-off between getting real-time capture rates versus getting the quality, high quality data. So you can get a very, very high quality 3D model of a person's head 
if you don't mind capturing the images and then putting it on a server somewhere to let it render for a couple of hours for one frame. Okay, you can get. We know from things like the Kinect, for instance, that you can actually get real-time 3D data, but it's usually a lot more noisy. The quality isn't as good. So there's sort of a trade-off there. So some of the challenges are dealing with either high-quality data that has a lot, you know, it's very large, or dealing with low-quality data that's really low noisy. Okay. The theory is, is that because it addresses a lot of these issues with head pose, lighting, and whatnot, 3D is potentially better than 2D. Then finally, you've got 4D. 4D basically is 3D plus time, so dynamic 3D information, okay? So it's kind of a video of 3D information. The reason why this is important is because it's been discovered that dynamic information is a lot more important for recognizing expression than we thought it was, okay? So you can look at a person's face and maybe determine their expression, but if it's really subtle, it's a lot harder to see it. However, if you have the video of them starting to smirk, for example, it's a lot easier to determine that something happened rather than just looking at an image and saying, is he smiling, is he not smiling, I can't tell. So dynamic information has been found to be important and 4D combines all the advantages of 3D plus all the dynamic stuff. But again, we've stapled on another dimension. It means the data is even larger, yeah? Can we think of 3D as being two plus one where we have 2D plus time instead of 3D plus time? You have 3D plus time. But we could do 2D plus time also? Yeah, we can do 2D plus time as well. And that, there's definitely a lot of work done with uh, 2D dynamic information, which basically is 2D plus time, which to avoid confusion, we don't usually refer to that as 3D because then it starts getting right. really wait, do you mean real 3D or three right. dynamic 3D? But yeah, no, there's a lot of work that's been done to look at the dynamic information in 2D. And that's actually what's prompted people to say, well, hang on, if dynamic information is important for 2D, then surely it must be important for 3D as well. So it's trying to get the best of both worlds. Um, the problem is, is that in addition to the large data size of 4D, there's also the issue that there are buckets of databases that have 4D information. Um, I can tell you that at Binghamton, where I got my master's and PhD, I was involved in the work involved to create some 3D and 4D databases that have to do with expression. So, but there aren't a lot of them out there. And one of the bigger problems with research is when you just don't have data to work with. So that's started to change, obviously, but it's still kind of an issue. So, so that's the overarching, that's kind of the big general challenge that's there. But there's other ones as well. Broadly, there's algorithm development. So, okay, we've got all this 4D information. What's important? How do, what's the important information? How do we get it out of there in an efficient and effective way. Ideally, we would like to have something that does everything in real time. But with 4D data, partially because of the capture rates or because of the noisy issue, this becomes problematic. Okay? There's also some other issues specific to expression work. And one of the issues is, first of all, prototypic expressions versus non-standard expressions. Okay, what am I talking about? A ways back, a psychologist named Paul Ekman figured out that there were certain expressions that were quote unquote universal across all different cultures. Okay? There's seven totally classified, but most of the time people just use these six. Angry, disgust, fear, happy, sad, and surprised. And for the most part, people express them in about the same way, or at least when it is expressed, it looks the same way. There are certain cultures where hiding an expression is valued more than expressing an emotion. But if they do express it, it usually follows one of these patterns. Okay? So there's been a lot of work done with recognizing these prototypic expressions, but there's kind of a problem with these. For the most part, you do encounter these in daily life, but not as often as some other expressions. Like a lot of times you'll see a confused expression that's not part of the standard set, or you'll have a bored expression or an interested expression. It doesn't really fall neatly into any of these six or the seventh category, which is usually contempt. So there's been a lot of work to say, all right, well, we can do prototypic, can we do some of the non-standard expressions? The other issue has to do with the way you collect the data. Is the expression posed or acted out? You know, so it's basically a fake, quote unquote. Or is it a spontaneous expression, which means it just naturally occurred because of some stimuli, all right? There's a reason to be interested in the difference between the two for things like lie detection. So is someone fake smiling versus real smiling or you know, faking an expression in general? But the problem with prototypic versus spontaneous is that 
the spontaneous expressions are a lot more difficult to classify. They're usually quicker, they're more variable in duration, they're also a lot more subtle. You know, it's very, any of the pose databases, you'll see, for instance, the expressions are pretty exaggerated. But for spontaneous information or spontaneous expressions, it's usually a little bit more downplayed, which makes it harder to detect. And then there's sort of issues having to do with, OK, how do you map the information we have to a machine response? So I want to make an interaction system. How do you use expression with that? It doesn't really make much sense to have, OK, if you raise your left eyebrow, we'll move the mouse to the left. But if you raise your right eyebrow, we'll move the mouse to the right. You probably want to have something that uses expression maybe to say, OK, well, if the person grimaces, probably the machine did something wrong. I better back up and undo whatever action I did. Like, he opened up Internet Explorer. OK, he grimaced. Probably I should undo that. <laughs> so I thought you guys might just thought that. <laughs> anyway. Um, and then there's also issues of, OK, well, we can just look at one piece of data. But, um, or we could try to say, well, OK, we've got 2D information and 3D information. A lot of these databases have both at the same time. So is there any way we can use both of those pieces of information at the same time, do classification in 2D, classification in 3D, and somehow either combine the results or combine the features all together? Is there something we can do combining different sort of pieces of data like expression and eye gaze. You know, a person rolls their eyes and grimaces, what does that mean versus when they roll their eyes and smile? And then there's also issues of when you actually do this kind of fusion. But the reason why you would want to do all this is because either it will increase the, the hope is it will either increase the accuracy overall of the system, or it will give you a more complex idea of what's going on, sort of a nuanced impression of what the user's state of mind is. We'll see an example of that when we get to the system. Okay, so what have I been doing about this? So first of all, I developed a 3D eye tracking and gaze estimation algorithm. Now it works on 2D information, but the model it uses under the hood is actually 3D. Um, and there was a recent patent accepted for this, so that's cool. Um, I've developed a 4D feature description for both pose and spontaneous expression recognition. And I've done expression recognition with both the prototypic expressions as well as action units. And I'll just explain this right now. There's two different ways you can look at expression. One is to look at it wholesale. So you look at the whole face and you say, are they angry or are they not angry? You classify in very broad strokes. Or you can look at the specific facial mus muscle activity. Okay? One of the other things that actually came up with was the facial action coding system which breaks up the face into about 40 different muscle movements that represent different parts of the face, like inner eyebrow up or outer eyebrow up or eye blink or what have you. Okay? So what you can do is look for different combinations of those action units, and that can give you the expression. Okay, so there's different ways of handling this. Anyway, the point is, is that we tried this feature out using action unit recognition as well. And the other side of this has been creating sort of overarching recognition systems that combine different pieces together. All right, so the first system, as I said, was more of an interaction, like a human computer interaction system. So combined head pose, as well as eye gaze and hand gestures. Uh, I'm one of my colleagues, the hand gesture part, not the rest of it. And also, we developed sort of an immersive simulation that combined head pose, expression, eye gaze, voice recognition, and a couple of other things to create an immersive interaction with these non-player characters. And I'll talk about that in more detail. And also, as I said, I worked on both the EU 4D facial expression database, which is a 4D database for posed expressions, and the more recent EP 4D spontaneous database. Before you go on, yes, that pattern was done through Binghamton? It was, yeah, it was, it was done through Binghamton. Yeah. Because that was where the work took place. Yeah, that was where the, the bulk of work took place. We actually applied for it about I want to say a year or two ago, we were taking, but it was recently accepted, like you know, this last November. So, yeah. so you know, work that takes place here. Too. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. There's no monkey business going on. No, no I didn't think there was monkey. I figured it was from Binghamton. No, 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 no. no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but originally it came, it came from Binghamton, and work was done there, so that's what happened. Good. All right. Well, that's good. It's not monkey business. It's 
Well, I just meant that, yeah, I, I, the, the attribution was correct. Let's put it okay. that way. There's no, you know, nothing going on behind the scenes. So, so I kind of want to spend more time just on that intro stuff, but let me get the actual algorithms now. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is eye tracking and gaze estimation. So there's been a fair amount of work done on this. Most of it has focused on, a lot of it takes advantage of the fact that when you look at the eye with an infrared camera and shoot infrared light towards the person's eye, the back of the retina reflects through the pupil and you see this big white dot that's impossible to miss. So a lot of eye tracking research focuses around having a camera that's sitting right here with a little LED light that shoots infrared first light into the person's eyes and detects the eye gaze direction. But that's not a great solution because, again, you're wearing this big headset that has this camera right there. It's not the most comfortable thing in the universe. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Just putting my arm in the head. Is that a, um, <clears throat> harmful to the person at all? They don't know. They, they, they do know that it does cause eye strain over very long periods of time. We have another project on campus who's... Yeah. Similar to the similar yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Eventually what happens is their eye starts to dry out a little bit because you're shining light into the person's eye. They can't see it, but it's there. Um, so yeah, it's not, they don't know if there's any sort of long-lasting effects with it, but yeah. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why, honestly, we try to get away from that with this because for one thing, it's an awkward setup, and for another, is this really a good idea of a long time? You know? <laughs> Shining light in a person's eye like this all the time, even if they can't see it, is such a small idea. But you know, but a lot of people have used it because, again, the pupil shows up as plain as day in the infrared camera. It's kind of hard to sort of turn that down. And then, you know, so then after that, there's been different approaches that then try to figure out, okay, well, we know where the pupil is, where are they looking at on the screen, or on, usually it's with reference to a screen. It's called space space. And there's been a lot of different ways to do this. A lot of them, again, have little infrared lights in the corner of the screen, and we'll look at how those reflect off the eye. Those are referred to as the lids. There was one paper a ways back that tried to look for the reflection of the screen off the person's eye, which was impressive, but you know, that's not always going to be a practical solution. So anyway. But the long and short of it is a lot of them focus on looking at the eye from really close up, which you don't always have. The other side of this is related to what kind of camera system you're going to have, whether it's going to be like right in the person's face. There are some systems that try to pull back a little bit more, but again, you're going to lose, the you know, farther you go back, the smaller the resolution is for the eye, so it's kind of problematic. And usually most of these systems don't allow you to just wander around the room. So what we did is we had, first of all, we have our eye gaze estimation approach, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But we also had our own camera setup that was consistent of a wide angle camera that would first find the person's face in the wide view. And then we had another active camera which was able to pan tilt and zoom its way into the person's face so you could get a high resolution image of the face and thus get a high resolution image or higher resolution image of the eye. So this allowed the person to sort of walk around the room and then once they stopped the camera could just go whoop, zoom in the person's face and get the person's eye gaze. Okay. So the basic algorithm for the eye gaze estimation approach is that, first of all, you have, we have another library we were using that detects the head pose. And based on that, we have the 3D offsets of the eye from the head. So it's basically, we do this through a calibration approach and we figure out where the 3D eyeballs are. What we then do is we take the, if you're familiar with graphics, this will make a lot more sense, but Basically, you take the image from the camera and we splat it onto the sphere like a texture. So this is kind of what it looks like. You see that we have the eyeball, 3D eyeball model, and we've basically wrapped the 2D image around the eyeball. Okay. The next step then is we take our little eyeball model and we rotate it around until it looks like this, where it looks like the, we're looking right into the pupil. Okay. And then from that, we do some, <clears throat> we extract the iris contour to figure out where the exact location of the pupil is. And based on how we rotate it to get this view, we know which, what the 3D direction is of the eye. Okay, so it's, again, it is using 2D information to get um, the estimation of the eye, but under the hood, it's using a 3D model. Okay. 
So for the actual gaze estimation, we have these contour points that you saw before. These guys over here, kind of a blurry image, but you get the idea. So based on those points, which are admittedly going to be a little bit on the noisy side, you have them mapped to the 3D sphere, and using this linear system, we ultimately figure out where the exact center of the pupil is. And this is based on two different constraints. One is we use an estimate for the iris center as one of the vectors, and we use basically the angle between each of these contour vectors and our theoretical center vector. Okay, the point is when we're done, we have our optical axis for our eye, which is basically a line that's going through the center of the eyeball, the center of the eyeball, through the center of the pupil. Okay. Now, the sad part of this is, is that in real life, the true vision center we have is not that line that goes through the eyeball center. It's actually slightly offset in a little area in the back called the folio, which is the area we have the most visual acuity. It's where all the cones are bunched up the highest. And what we end up doing is during the calibration stage where we have a person look at different uh, landmarks on the screen, we figure out how far the eye gaze is offset from this optical axis. So we actually end up figuring out not only the iris center, actually going this way, sorry. The iris center, we also figure out where the folia is in the back of the eye. Okay? So when we ultimately figure out gaze direction, we're using a vector that's going from the folia through the iris center onto whatever object we're looking at. So the theory is, is that this gives us, well, theory and practice, this gives us a more accurate view of where the person is looking. Okay. So we did some experiments with this. We set up 12 gaze markers, which are these little black squares when they're uh, on, there's a little white square there. And we had some subjects look at these markers for about two to four seconds each. And the accuracy we got was about 5.9 degrees. What this accuracy, the way this accuracy is determined is that we look at the angle from the pupil, we look at the vector from the pupil to the target, and then we look at the actual eye gaze vector or the estimated eye gaze vector and how far off that was. So when all the smoke cleared, we had about 5.9 accuracy, which is comparable to what a lot of other people in the field are doing. And it's cool because, again, we're just dealing with a 2D image that's potentially far away from the camera. We are using a zoom camera to accomplish this, but it still works pretty well. This hit percentage thing has to do with how often the cursor was inside each of these boxes when the person was supposed to be looking at the box. Okay, so you can see how the points are clustered around where they're supposed to be looking. And part of this also has to do with the fact that the eye does jump around a little bit, so we're, when we say we're looking at a point, it's a little bit fudgy on whether we are actually looking at the point. But either way, accuracy on this was pretty respectful on the whole. And like I said, this was work that eventually was accepted as packed. On that grid, which, where, where are the points they're actually looking at? These little black, this little black square or this little white square. So these guys. Right, on, on the, the data stuff. Uh, sort of, there's sort of a one to one correspondence here. I, I, didn't, I didn't draw them, but they were. So they're be, all centered, basically. Yeah. yeah, they're more or less, they're supposed to be centered towards the, right. the theoretical boxes. There's some fudge factor over here, as you can see, but generally speaking, they're supposed to be centered. Oh, so in that one, those ones that are out of the grid, they were actually points of where they were looking? Whether, yeah, where it was estimating they were looking a little bit off to the left here. This was just for one subject, just to keep in mind. This isn't like an amalgamation view. This just for one of them. But yeah, for this one, it was a little bit off, you know, a little bit off the grid here. Well, the other ones compared to the other ones, it looks like it's a while off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm not exactly sure what was going on with that particular one, but at least for the other ones, everything was pretty well clustered. So. Or co conceivably, it could be some um, uh, malformation of that person's eye or something like that, right? Yes. Uh, we might call it that. Right? It's possible. It could also have something to do with, um, yeah, it could be something along those lines. Uh, maybe they're left. You know, keep in mind, we're using the com combination. We average the vectors from both the left eye and the right eye. There are different schools of thought on this. You can either just use a combination of the vectors and average them out. Another school of thought is to try to get the intersection of the two eye vectors. In theory, that's what you should be doing, but in practice, it's really hard to get that intersection point between those two vectors without there being some noise in the way. So it's not bulletproof in that respect. 
but it may just have it may have something to do with that as well. So how uh, typical is this particular grid? You said this was one person. I mean, you must have them for more than one person, right? Yeah, no, yeah, we have uh, several uh, subjects. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but this was pretty typical of the behavior for the rest of them. So uh, we just picked this one. What I'm, what I'm wondering about on the typicality is that uh, lower left-hand part was was the um, the non the less accurate points were they all in that area? Not that I can recall. I don't believe so. Okay. Um, all right. So um, it may, I believe it was specific to this subject, if I recall correctly. So. Okay. Is there yeah. anything special about the square number six? Other than that was just one we picked. It could have been any other. So I, 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 I did this to demonstrate what it looked like when this when the truck subject was supposed to be looking at subject six. This little white dot below okay. is supposed to be. <clears throat> yeah. This isn't special. This is just a screenshot. Okay. One more question. Sure. This type of experiment requires a lot of infrastructure, or it's very simple. It's well, I mean, it, for this test, we actually had a, a, this you know thing set up on a laptop, and we were built in webcam that was on the laptop itself. Uh, the biggest problem with this kind of work is you need to know the exact estimate of how the screen is relative to the camera. So it's a non-zero possibility that. What we're seeing here with this left drift may have had something to do with the screen and the camera not being fully calibrated or not perfectly calibrated. So, yeah. Was the real time aspect of this something that a typical laptop could do, or was this off loaded to a. No, it was, the laptop was running in real time. Okay. Was doing. So, yeah, this was a real time algorithm all the way. So, we didn't need, we didn't need to offload this to a supercomputer for this right. to work right. So, and actually, the, the other two system. Uh, approach it, the uh, systems we developed to use this IDAS algorithm in real time as it was working. So. Okay. All right. So, and this gives you an idea of sort of the angular. There is some variation of the angular gaze accuracy as you go farther out on the edges of the screen. So I should show this first, actually. But you can see that, generally speaking, it's in a pretty reasonable. Yeah, I'll just show you this part because it's actually kind of cool. This is just some shots of the early version of the algorithm working. So we'll jump to the next side of the place. So the white dotted lines are the estimation of where I'm looking. And this was an early version, so that's why it's stopping when I'm moving my head, but future versions will actually. Or a saddle ridge, or saddle rather, 
and various different kinds of 3D shapes. What we do is we extended this to 4D. So there's a, it looks like a 3D shape, but you can see like here there's a cylinder in 3D that's going through the area here. Okay? And based on these guys in the original approach, these were assigned to the labels. In our 4D approach, we assign a label and we also assign a direction. So we'll get to that. So the basic approach is for a local piece of the face. We do this for all the areas of the face. We pull out the, three, the 4D information here. We build a voxel-based representation of it. We fit it to this complicated polynomial. And then we pull out the relevant curvature terms and build something called a Weingarten matrix. And it turns out if you get the eigenvectors of this, you end up with the principal directions for the shape. Okay, so this is like the central axis here of the cylinder shape here. Okay. And there were 15 different shapes you could get. So you can see those are positive and negative spheres. You can see cylinders, a wall. These are the idealized shapes. We didn't do that idea of the shapes we before. Hyperbolic shapes, and the middle one there is a flat curve. Basically, nothing is happening. So, yeah? Would you mind going back? What are the curvatures? What are the curvatures? I'm sorry, what? Would you mind to go one slide back? Sure. So this polynomial fitting, so curvatures, these are coefficients of this polynomial. So. Yeah, we're pulling out the um, this 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 coefficient and let's see, D E F here as well. These guys here. These are the combined ones for you know the uh, X Y X T and the Y T correct directions. Well, these are just these squared ones. There. And these polynomials, they they are supposed to represent the surface. It's supposed to represent this this voxel here. So this is, because it's 4D, because the data is 4D, there's X, Y, and T, and then the value inside is actually the depth. Okay. So normally you would just fit it to a 3D surface and use the height as your value. Um, in this case, we're using the height as the value inside of a voxel grid and fitting it to that polynomial. So and that's basically to sort of force it to that shape. Yep. Are angles characterizing spatial dimensions or also time? <laughs> uh, this is there's one of these dimensions is time, so yeah, there's time. Like time is mixed in. Time is mixed in. There's x, y, and t, right. and then the depth or z, quote unquote, is basically the value inside of each of the boxes. Okay. Alright. So once we so basically we look at the curvature values. Uh, from here, from this part over here. And we use that, a threshold, to determine what kind of shape it is. Okay. And it ends up being classified as one of these 15 shapes, whatever the closest one is. Now the problem is, is that in the original topographic approach, you could just use a single label and you knew what shape it was, end of story. But the problem is, is that we need to make a distinction between two different labels depending on their orientation and time. So these guys have the same label. But this one's rotated where there's a big change in going across time. So time is this axis here. But this one, there's no change in time. Obviously, for dynamic expression recognition, this is kind of a big deal knowing the difference between those two. So what we do is we look at the direction of least curvature, which is kind of the central axis of the shape. And we look at its angle from the time axis. And we could optionally use either the phi or the theta angle. Most of our experiments, we ended up just using phi because I found to be the most useful one. Okay, but that gives us an idea of whether or not the shape in question we have is actually causing any variation in time or not. And then after that, we get all of those features that are inside of a spatial temporal block. So if you picture the face like as if it's an image, you're drawing a square for each piece of the face and you're extending that back across all of the video frames. So all of the features that were inside of that box, we use those to build a histogram for each of those block features, and then we concatenate each of those region histograms to form the final feature vector. And then we throw that into a classifier to get our answers. Okay. The comparison approach we did was something called LVP top. It stands for local binary patterns from three orthogonal planes. This the easiest, the quickest and easiest way to describe this is that you build three planes, one from going across you know, xy, one going across xt, and one going across yt. You get the features from each of those planes and build a histogram. 
and then you can concatenate those histograms together. Okay, the specific feature they use is something called LVP, which looks at the surrounding values at a given point, thresholds them based on the center value, and then turns that into a binary number, which becomes your label. It's actually a very cool approach, and it's, and it's also one of the more popular approaches, which is why we chose it for our comparison. Okay, so for the experiments, we tested on BU4D, which is consists of posed prototypic expressions, and it's a 4D database, so you can see the 2D model as well as the 3D model there. And we also tested it on the BP4D spontaneous database, which, and for, these, for this we looked for trying to do AU recognition. And since the data in there is spontaneous, we, the data was spontaneous AU recognition. Okay. Alright, so this is the results. Accuracy was pretty good overall. Uh, the weighted average of everything we got in accuracy for BU4D was 76%. This turned out to be 3% better than using LVP top on the depth data. And it was also 5% better than just using a timeless variant to be first. So we also tested just looking at the peak frame of the expression with the original topographic approach and said, okay, are we actually getting any benefit out of using dynamic information? And as it turned out, it was. Now it was still it was comparable to LVP top on the 2D images, so it was slightly higher for them, 76.9 versus 76.1. But at the same time, keep in mind that with 2D you have all these issues of pose and lighting and occlusion and whatnot. So there's benefits to pursuing a 3D approach. And this was our results for the AUs. Now as you can see, it's you know, we beat everybody except for AU12. And although the results don't seem very high, you have to keep in mind that this is spontaneous data. This is a lot more subtle, this is a lot harder to classify. So this is very promising compared to other work that's in the field right now. So, so I'm all satisfied with the results. And that would be average AUC score as well. Okay. So that was Right now, as far as specific algorithmic work, right now I'm working on stuff related to micro-expressions, which are expressions that flash across the face. Those are even harder than garden variety expressions to detect and to classify, and that's what the focus of my current active research is, and I'm working on a publication for that at the moment. But that's just sort of the early work that's built up to that. So now let's talk a little bit about the... I'm probably way over time. Right? Everybody good? What are we going to say? No, I'm out of here. The polite way to say that is I have an appointment I have to go. <laughs> Pressing engagement, not here. <laughs> okay, just want to make sure. So I know I overshot this a bit. But anyway. So now I want to talk about some of the combined systems that I've worked on. And we'll start with the human computer interaction system that we developed. So there's a lot of systems that will use a subset of the kinds of information you can get. So there are systems that use eye gaze by itself for human computer interaction. There are systems that will also use head pose by itself. And there's also obvious examples of people using hand pointing or hand gestures for interaction systems. But it's odd to see a system that combines these all into one system. It's not a normal thing. Um, the argument is, of course, that if we use multiple modalities, you can get more refined control, you can do more stuff, it's more advanced. So that's why we decided to take that route here. So we combined eye gaze, head pose, position, hand pointing, and we also used mouth opening and closing. Um, this was part of a library we were using, so we were able to just we added that in. But the major focus of this is the eye gaze, the head pose, and the hand pointing. We used our two camera system from our eye gaze work. So there's the broad angle camera there, and there's our hand tilt zoom camera. And we also had two cameras up here, one here and one here to do the hand tracking. And we had two applications to test this out. One was a sort of a 3D file system navigator. So basically your files are floating above this sphere, and you use your head to rotate the sphere left and right. You use your hand to point out which one you want. And you can use a combination of your eye gaze and your hand to create this sort of box to zoom into the sphere a little bit closer. The other application we developed was 
sort of an educational globe program. So it's very similar to this one in the sense you turn your head to rotate the globe, you can click on countries and they would play their national anthem. And again, you can use the combination of your eyes and your hand to zoom into a piece of the globe. So the Wii systems that children use, do they use some of this? The Wii, okay, the, the Wii actually uses a, it seems it's counterintuitive, there's a infrared light that's actually on the TV and then there's a sensor in that little stick thing or whatever that figures out where that's going. The closest analog to this would be something like the Kinect, which has an honest to goodness depth camera sitting there. There's a later project where we use it marginally, but not directly. Um, but that's the same sort of thing, uh, where basically it looks for that hand blob and figures out where to move the cursor on the screen. Okay. So when we did the, the hand work was done by another colleague of mine, and at the time that we were doing it, the Kinect, I think, only just come out. So Developing it, we're still thinking in terms of using 2D information. Um, but you know, that now I would argue that we definitely want to start moving towards using more depth information, even if it is noisy for whatever kinds of uh, gesture recognition. So, uh, let's see. This is sort of an overview of the overarching system. Uh, there's sort of rough face detection done here. Then this controls the camera so that this guy can zoom into the face. And once you have that, you can get mouth information, which is the opening and closing thing. You can get head pose information, which is then fed to the iris detection as well as the gaze estimation out. And then these two cameras here dealt with the hand tracking part, which ultimately gave you the cursor on the screen. One more question. Sure. I'm thinking about you doing this work here. Mm -hmm. I assume you're still collaborating with things, but if you wanted to do the work here, is there a lot of infrastructure required to support this? This one's a little bit more involved. I mean, you need, you need the cameras for openers, and you would want to have a space where, in this case, we have like a large screen television, and we put the cameras on top of there. One thing that I would like to see that, um, like, what I would like to develop is something where we have a very, very, very precise notion of how the camera relates to the screen. You know, we did this a little bit. Um, you know, we, we estimated it as best we could, but I would like to see something where the camera is permanently, forever and ever clamped down on the screen. We measured it precisely to the millimeter that everything is exactly the way we want it. A dedicated space for it. Yeah, a dedicated space where this is all set up and ready to go. Um, so that would be something I'd like to see. But yeah, this requires a little bit more because of the nature of the setup we have. This is sort of a, like I say, sort of a living room-esque kind of setup or something along those lines. So it's a little bit more. Do your, are your students able to engage in any of these kinds of projects? Or is this too far? No, I mean, uh, as, as soon as I, uh, any student who would be interested in doing something along these lines, you know, absolutely, of course, you know, <laughs> I have no problems with them doing that. Um, I don't have any students who are working on this at this particular juncture, but I have no problem, I would want to see something more advanced in this regard. Uh, particularly, especially now that they've upgraded, like, at the time that this was done, the original first Kinect was 640 by 480, which is a resolution that computer vision people stubbornly insist on using, even though it's old as dirt. Yes, it was standard resolution back in the 90s, but it isn't anymore. <laughs> you know, now we use IT20 by 1080. I would like to, the new Kinect actually does higher resolution. It does 1920 by 1080, which I would love to see some more work done with a depth, that kind of high resolution depth, high resolution comparatively and see what we can get out of that, mm -hmm. combined with something that's a little bit more dedicated like this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is definitely, this is not something that I want to go away with dinosaur. This is something I would like to see more involvement with, taking the things that we've already developed and then combining them into a system that's actually meant to be used. So, I guess that's that. <coughs> Absolutely, yes, thank you. All right. So this is sort of a brief slide on the hand tracking algorithm. Again, this was, you know, this was done by another colleague of mine. The short version of it is that they take the image from the hand and they sort of probe it into polar coordinates based on an estimated center of the hand using a color detector. And then it uses the cascade detectors and add a boost approach to figure out, classify which way the hand is pointing based on this. And it also uses an uh, active appearance model tracker as well. But anyway, ultimately what this has done, it does give you a 3D 
vector on the finger of where the person is pointing. What, what does image walking to polar coordinates mean? It just means that they're taking they're taking the image like from the top down view for here. They know where the center of the hand is roughly, and they're basically unwrapping this. It's like as if you cut this here and then cut it around here and then sort of stretched it out, and there you go. So that's the image they end up using. So. Okay, so that so what that's referring to is walking the image to to come up with the full coordinates. Yeah, well, to come up with, with this particular image representation, which is what they use to detect features on the plastic button there. So this is a close-up view of the two systems in place. I can actually show you a quick video over here. Right. 
Um, so the system we have here combined head pose, eye gaze, facial expression, and also a speech and text-to-speech component. So pretty much already said most of that, but let me get into the details of the specific algorithms we're using. So we use, this time we opted to use, we had two different variations of this. One was a variation that's meant for you sitting at a desktop. So it's presumed the only camera you have is your webcam that's sitting on top of your computer. The other variation we had of this was using the Kinect to determine where your head is located because the Kinect SDK actually does provide a location for different parts of a core skeleton for your body. So we used the 3D location from that and then used the pan tilt zoom camera to zoom into your face. So at the end of the day, we're still using 2D information for the work we're doing here. This is kind of a potential pre-processing step. Okay, so we're not using depth streams with this. This is also why we didn't use our, uh, our nebula feature thing for this particular project. We ended up using a variation of LVP top on shape index information. I'll get to that in a minute. But you can see what happens here. A 2D stream goes here. It's split off to head pose, the eye gaze, and also the facial expression recognition. And all of this is mapped together. The head pose is used to control tilting to the left, turning to the left and right. The eye gaze is tracked to determine what it is you're looking at. So it takes, keeps track of whether you're looking at the NPCs. It keeps track of whether you were looking at the paintings. Also, how long you were looking at the paintings. And we'll come and play in a minute. Uh, and different things along those lines. There's also a speech tracker here that picks out certain words like hello and also evaluation words like amazing, good, bad, or awful. Okay. The combination of the speech and the facial expression is used to determine what the player's evaluation of the painting is at any given point. This is where we experimented a little bit with fusion. So if the person looks at the painting and smiles and says it's good, okay, that's a positive evaluation. Nothing really to write home about. But if they look at the painting, smile, and then say it's awful, we interpret that as if they're mocking the painting. So we have different nuanced evaluations depending on the combination of speech versus expression. Granted, it's fairly straightforward, but it's something that can be potentially expanded. Okay. And then you can see the NPCs here just respond accordingly based on your reactions. They also have their, we expanded this a little bit more in the sense that the NPCs actually have their own personalities. So there's certain NPCs who, if you say something's awful, they'll get angry about it, versus some of them will actually be like, oh, okay, dude, sorry, I'm not. <laughs> it means to disturb your eyes with this horrible piece of work. <laughs> so I already said this already. There's two different possible camera setups you could have had. Um, this is the setup of the active camera, but the alternative would have been to have just a regular webcam. And that's actually what we did the test with. The head pose estimation was primarily done by a colleague of mine, a colleague of mine Binghamton, uh, Hung Lu, uh, but I was also involved as well. The basic idea is that it detects the face, it uses the active appearance model approach to track certain points on the face, and scales them to this sort of underlying 3D generic head model. And from there, it figures out what the orientation of the face is from there. Okay. For the expression recognition, we used LBP top because it's a robust algorithm in 2D, but we applied it to the shape index image rather than the regular image. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Shape index basically is a way of labeling the curvature. So recall from before we had the topographic approach, shape index is an alternative way of determining what shape it is on the surface. Okay? So it's a single number that you can get out of there and you can scale it to a new image that ranges from 0 to 255, so the original value scales from 0 to 1. And we use these images rather than these to actually get the expression. And it actually works a little bit better than the small numbers, which is what we did. Okay. So for this project, we decided that it was reasonable to have person-specific templates for expression. Okay. So what we did was we had each person Record their expressions, as it were, one of the, you know, the typical, you know, angry, disgust, fear, happy, sad, and surprise. And we use those as templates that we compare to while we're doing the expression recognition. Okay, it was reasonable in this context based on the application we were doing. Ideally, you would like to do person independent expression recognition, but for this one, we felt it was okay to do 
person specific recognition. And consequently, let's see, let's see, we tested this out on the DU4D database, and the accuracy was comparatively high given the neighborhood size that we used. Because when you're doing the shape index, what you're doing is you're getting a neighborhood of points in that specific that particular spot on the image. Okay? But you can check, you can vary how large that neighborhood is. So depending on how large or small the neighborhood was, it increased the accuracy of the AUC, as you can see over here. So we ended up picking 13 pixels as our neighborhood size. Okay. So the accuracy, again, this is person specific, but still, we got 96.4 with a 13 by 13 neighborhood size, which was 3% higher than just using the garden variety 2D grayscale. So that encouraged us to use this for our final system. Okay. And actually, these are all the misclassified samples that we had. And even these, you can sort of see, this was classified as, this was technically neutral, but as you can see, it was classified as sad. But to be fair, you can see where it might have confused some of these. So most of the misclassification examples were what we consider reasonable, but you know, there's a few odd ducks. Okay, so the head pose alters the view. So you turn your head to the left and it will scroll left until you look back at the center again. Same thing with scrolling to the right. For the facial expression, we use a majority, for, uh, to make this as robust as possible, we used a majority voting scheme based on frame history. So it would detect the expression in each frame, but then would pick out what the total expression was over the past and gave so many frames based on sort of the majority voting scheme. We also track eye gaze, and again, we keep track of the current target the player is looking at based on a majority voting scheme, because again, the eye does have a tendency to jump around a little bit, and we wanted more of a sort of an average view of where the person, what object the person we're looking at. Okay. So the process for the user, the player, is that he goes up to the NPC, asks them about the, the NPC asks them about what they think of their work. If the player had been looking at the painting before saying hello to the NPC, the NPC will say, oh, I see you've been looking at my painting, and would respond accordingly. Then based on the player's expression plus the value, verbal evaluation, that would be the painting evaluation, and the NPC responds based on what you said as well as their personality. So the different player evaluations we had were dislike, which is just bad or awful combined with anger and disgust. Polite dislike, which was a fear expression with bad or awful. Happy with bad or awful was considered mocking. Sad with bad or awful was considered a polite dislike. Surprised with bad or awful was shock. And then a neutral expression would just be considered just no <coughs> The good, amazing ones are a little bit more averaged out, but the standouts here are angry and disgust with a positive verbal evaluation is considered envy. So you're annoyed about it, but you can't help but admit that it was good. And then surprised with pure or amazing would be considered awe. So, so as you can see, we use this you know, experimental thing, but we use the fusion of two different inputs to create a more nuanced view of what the player subject was thinking or doing. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but these would be different emotional responses based on your evaluation versus their personality. So we had somebody who was cheerful, he was green, somebody who was miserable, he was blue, and somebody who was cowardly, he was yellow. And these are the different possible potential responses you can see here. So if you're mocking, for example, cowardly guy is going to be a little bit afraid. Whereas if you're mocking to the miserable guy, he's just going to be mildly angry. Let's see. There's a couple of other differences here if you go through it. Um, one of the key things about this, and we had to mention in the paper, is that even though we were using famous paintings, I'm not trying to imply this is Da Vinci and this is Pollock or whatever, we weren't trying to make any assessments of their personality. But anyway. The other, if you didn't look at the painting and made a negative evaluation, that was considered dismissive. So that's been technically a separate classification versus all of the like-dislike. So if you didn't look at the painting and you made an evaluation that was bad, the artist would say, but you didn't even look at it. So it's a different way that they would respond in addition to the initial reading. Okay. All right, so. And these are the different, we have different intensities for the expressions on the, play, on the NPCs. So I've been told this guy vaguely looks like Kermit, but <laughs> either way, um, I, I'm, I still was learning, to, learning 3D at the time, so 
mod my modeling skills were not exactly the highest and best in the best, but either way, I did the job. <laughs> so, based on what you said, bad versus awful, bad would have been a mild version of your evaluation, whereas awful would be a stronger version of it, which would influence how strong their response was as well, which is why we have these three intensities in the first place. So we did two different kinds of evaluations. One was a quantitative evaluation that had to do with how accurate the system was at assessing what your, um, what the, you know, correctly assessing your expression as well as your evaluation. Okay, so in terms of expression, you can see here, we used a history size of 50 frames, keep in mind we're going about 25, 30 frames per second. And the average accuracy was pretty high. We are using person specific templates here. But still, it's certainly robust enough to use that kind of false positives, false negatives. I'm sorry, what? False positives, false negatives. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of here, but this is the corresponding area under curve, uh, area under ROC values here. So that's going to give you an idea of what the false positive, false negative curve looks like. So as you can see, those are pretty high as well. Um, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, generally speaking, it was pretty well done. Okay. And that's the confusion table for that one. Actually, sorry, that answers your question. <laughs> this is our confusion table. So you, as you can see, it's a strong diagonal here. Um, neutral is not classified because we weren't looking for it. That's why this is zero over here and why there's all zeros down here. But we did take note of when something was classified as neutral and it wasn't. So that's what this column is over here. All right. Uh, this was the evaluation on the evaluation, which is really confusing to write about, let me tell you. <laughs> as you can see, it was also fairly high, 97.2. So we, in our actual experiment, we had the person sit down and cycle through all the different possible evaluations and we could get a test run with each person each possible evaluation. As you can see, it all worked out pretty well. So let's see. Yeah, that's the confusion that for that. Again. Paper. This is a chart showing the size of our history versus the accuracy in AUC for facial expression and evaluation. So, as you can see, this goes up the more farther back you go, the more information you include. But once you get past a certain point, now you're starting to include information that is going too far back. So now you're starting to get pieces of where they're not showing the expression anymore or whatever it is they're trying to do. So there's sort of a sweet spot to hit. <coughs> and we also did a qualitative evaluation. So after each subject went in and played the game, we asked them questions about, OK, well, overall, how fun was the experience? Was it comfortable to use? Was it easy to use? Did you feel like the eye tracking helped in any way? Did the head pose help make things more immersive or comfortable or intuitive? Same thing with facial expression and also the NPCs themselves. And as you can see, on average, Everybody was, you know, it was a rating, rating from you know, four to, you know, one to five, and all of them were above a four, and most of them were above a four point five. So on the whole, the response from it was pretty good. Okay, so I'm going to show you a quick video before we mention. Unfortunately, we weren't very good at audio recording, so some of this we want to make sure that your ears are okay. good. So I just wanted to discuss the low. You can barely hear this guy, he just said hello. We're using a text to speech thing, which is why it sounds so mechanical. Amazing. You are not. He said you were an odd word together with this I'm using my head to turn around. Hello. Something I would like to see going forward with this is we basically built our own homegrown, I don't want to say game engine, that's too grand a term, but <laughs> we built our own little homegrown 3D navigation thing. What I would really like to see is 
using something like the Unreal Engine or the Unity Engine or whatnot, and integrating this kind of technology right in there, so at least we can get player models that don't like Kermit the Frog, and also have a little bit more expressiveness both you know, with the NPCs as well as the environment. So that's something I would like to see as part of the overarching. Can you discuss this with Ibrahim Yusuf? Uh, yes, yeah, we've been, uh, we've, we've been talking about really good issues since we've that point, so. So in conclusion, my work sort of has two overarching focuses. One is trying to get the algorithms that do the individual recognition tasks, as well as trying to combine them all into systems that use them in effective ways. So for future work, obviously we can always improve speed and efficiency, how accurate things are. I'd like to, to develop this further for low-powered hardware. So everything we've been doing, all the real-time stuff does work on you know, garden variety desktops and laptops. But I would like to see this advance to the point where it can work on a relatively low power smartphone or whatnot. Okay. There's also general issues with noise. You always want to increase robustness to that. We'd like to explore fusion a little bit more in detail, especially with respect to combining different data types at a lower level, using a combined fe a feature that's actually combining 2D and 3D information before it gets anywhere near the classifier. So, a lot of my work right now is focusing on micro-expression detection, which, as I said, is like the harder subset of all this expression-related work. And obviously, the end goal is a sort of general human-aware system that you can adapt to whatever your particular application is. Um, obviously, I want to acknowledge the people who have been a part of all this. Uh, Xing Zhang, Sean Kanavon, Peng Lu, Kang Fu, and my advisor, Dr. Vijay Yin from Davidson, were collaborators on this work as I went through, obviously, because PhD at the time, and the work was also funded by, a part at least, by Air Force Research Lab, National Science Foundation, and also the New York State and Technology Office.